Hello, it's Mundo Monday, and today is Indigenous Peoples Day in the United States. The World Health Organization defines Indigenous peoples as communities that live within or are attached to geographically distinct traditional habitats in ancestral territories and who identify themselves as being part of a distinct cultural group descended from groups present in the area before modern states were created and current borders defined. What does that mean in plain language. Basically, indigenous cultures are whatever cultures were in a place before another culture came and took that place over. Suddenly, the people who were originally there aren't the ones in charge anymore and aren't even the dominant culture anymore. Throughout history, various rulers have conquered other lands to control larger and larger amounts of territory and the people there. From the 1400s and into the 1800s, a few countries in Europe raced to take over as much of the world as they could. On October 12, 1492, Christopher Columbus, an Italian explorer working for the King and Queen of Spain, landed his ship in what is now called the Bahamas. Until then, most Europeans didn't even know that North and South America existed. But as soon as they did, colonizers from Spain, Portugal, England, France, and the Netherlands hurried over to grab as much of this new land as they could. But what of the people who already lived in the Americas? They were robbed, murdered, enslaved, sickened by new diseases from Europe that they'd never had to deal with before, and generally bossed around by the colonizers. Now, after some of those European settlers broke away from England to form the United States, the U.S. government called the Monday closest to October 12th Columbus Day in honor of so-called discovery of this new land. But Columbus was such a jerk to the Native Americans he conquered, and the colonizers that followed him weren't all that better. So Columbus Day doesn't feel much like a reason to celebrate, particularly not for the descendants of the people he conquered. That's why many cities and states have decided to celebrate this day as Indigenous Peoples Day instead, a day to celebrate the cultures and histories of the Native peoples of what is now the United States and remind mainstream U.S. culture that they are still here. We are still here. Native American Truths Everyone Should Know is a book by an author-illustrator team that we read last Thanksgiving, Tracy Sorrell and Frenet Lassac. You might remember that Tracy Sorrell shared some of her Cherokee culture and language in Ojali Halika. We are grateful. In We Are Still Here, though, she's going to tell us about ways the United States laws have affected all the different Native nations within its borders. Many people do not know that many Native American tribes are actually still their own nations within the United States. People born into a tribal nation are citizens of both their tribal nation and the United States. So Tracy Sorrell is a citizen of both the United States and the Cherokee Nation. See, this boy here is carrying the Cherokee flag. And the other children are carrying flags of other Native nations within the U.S. And look what they're doing. They're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day at school. These kids have each prepared a presentation on one of 12 aspects of the U.S. interaction with Native nations. And here, Tracy Sorrell introduces us. I think that's actually her right there in the picture teaching. It looks like her at least. A bit. She says, Our Native nations have always been here. We are indigenous to the continent now called North America. Our leaders are sovereign and have the power to make rules. Our ways of life changed when white people arrived from Europe. In 1776, white people broke free from England and created their own country called the United States of America, which affected our lives even more. Like European rulers before them, the leaders of the new U.S. government signed legal agreements called treaties with the Native nations. These treaties recognize the sovereignty of our Native nations. That means that they were in charge of themselves. 
to exercise control and power over our people and lands. But some treaties forced Native people to leave our homes or sell the lands where our ancestors lived. The U.S. government made promises to Native nations in almost 400 treaties altogether, but the federal government did not always keep its promises to the tribes. Most of the time, their laws and policies have been devastating. Most people do not know what happened to Native nations and our citizens after treaty making stopped in 1871. Despite the continued occupation of our homelands, regular attacks on our sovereignty, and being mostly forgotten in U.S. culture, Native nations all say, we are still here. And these are all the subjects they're going to talk about in their presentations. What known as presentation, assimilation. Most U.S. leaders did not respect our ways and thought it would be better for us to adopt their beliefs and practices. From the country's earliest days, white men sought to weaken our Native nation's power to govern, destroy Native families by taking our children away and sending many to boarding schools, outlawed our sacred practices or religion, and punish us for speaking our own languages. But even under these harsh laws, Native nations say, we are still here. Key's presentation, allotment. White people wanted to control and sell even more of our tribal lands. Native nations had already given up larger pieces of land for smaller ones in treaties. In fact, the United States passed laws that divided up the remaining allotted lands of many tribes and gave a certain amount of land to each tribal citizen, but then sold the leftover land to white settlers and railroad companies. In spite of all this, Native nations say, we are still here. Task Plus presentation, the Indian New Deal. The U.S. government tried to help many people during the Great Depression, but its leaders saw how badly Native people suffered compared to others. Knowing that, Congress crafted a series of new laws that protected tribal culture, arts, and crafts, allowed Native languages and traditions to be taught in schools, set aside money to buy back lost tribal lands, and changed most tribes' governing systems to operate more like the U.S. government, which was not always helpful. Noting these new laws, Native nations say, we are still here. But now Chase's presentation is termination. In order to save money, the U.S. government decided to stop honoring some of the treaty agreements with more than 100 Native nations. This terminated our relationship with the federal government and no longer allowed our tribes or citizens to be legally separate in the United States. Although our tribes kept their part of each treaty, the United States stopped working with the tribal leaders, sold the effective Native nations' lands and resources, and lowered the government's financial duty to the tribes nationwide. It means they wouldn't help them with money anymore. The return of these anti-sovereignty policies, our Native nations say, we are still here. You see, they're saying that this is our land. Honor our treaties. And they're just like fishing like, no. Katie's presentation, relocation. The federal government wanted us to leave our tribal lands and live and act more like white people. So Congress passed a law that pushed aside the fact that indigenous people are separate under the law with rights as citizens of our native nations and of the United States, and encouraged us to move to cities far from our tribal homes, promised jobs and schooling to those who moved, led to populations of poor native people with little support in cities and suburbs. But even with our people scattered throughout the country, Native nations still say, we are still here. Jesse's presentation, tribal activism. Native citizens continue to speak up, organize, and increase our long-standing commitment to strengthen tribal sovereignty, speak out against termination and relocation, recover our lands, and harvest traditional foods, draw attention to Native people's lack of sufficient health care, and help students go to college, including on tribal lands. 
With our collective voice and presence, Native Nations say, we are still here. Will's presentation, self-determination. Native nations needed more control of our own lives, so we pushed back on federal rules that oversaw nearly every part of our life on our lands. To support tribal sovereignty, the United States passed laws that recognized that our governments could handle our own affairs, helped Native nations offer programs and services directly to our citizens, restored many terminated tribes to a federally recognized status, and allowed some tribes to recover lands lost during the allotment and termination. While pressuring Congress to carry out these laws, our Native nations repeatedly say, we are still here. DJ's presentation. Indian Child Welfare and Education. Native nations care about the welfare and education of our children. We need to stop officials in various states from removing thousands of our children from their families and placing them in non-native homes. Can you imagine you just being kidnapped from your family and put in somebody else's family? Native nations prompted Congress to approve laws that blocked state officials from taking our children without notifying our tribe. Focused on native children staying with family or other tribal citizens address the specific education needs of Native children in our communities. To protect and provide for our future generations, Native nations say, we are still here. Maya's presentation, Religious Freedom. Native people challenged federal and local laws and policies that have banned us from freely practicing our traditional religions. Native nations sought help from the U.S. Supreme Court so that we could practice our beliefs and ceremonies, tribes could access sacred sites outside of our lands, and tribal citizens could keep and use sacred objects. When the court did not support us, Native nations sought support from Congress to say, we are still here. Ellis presentation, economic development. Tribal leaders noticed our people failing financially while others in the United States succeeded. Some Native nations opened casinos as a way to make money on our lands where few opportunities existed. This type of business allows those tribes to vary how people earn a living and care for themselves, use profits to develop businesses and employment, pay for important services like police, fire stations, and health care offer scholarships and after-school programs, as well as operate tribally-run schools. And even though the federal government regulates tribal casinos, Native nations still say, we are still here. Chuki's presentation, language revival. Remember that from last year in, in Tracy Sorrell's last book? Sequoia's syllabary. It's like an alphabet, except it's syllables instead of individual letters. Native nations want to increase the number of tribal language speakers. This is necessary to pass on values, stories, and ceremonies to future generations. Seeking to preserve our cultures, Native nations urged Congress to approve laws to encourage teaching Native languages in schools, allow our Native speakers to teach in classrooms, give financial grants to tribes and schools for language programs, Speaking indigenous languages strengthens our heritage, so each native nation says in our own language, we are still here. Chance's presentation, sovereign resurgence. Having survived disease, war, and federal rules meant to destroy us in our way of life, native nations continue to exercise our sovereignty. Together we take action to speak up for the land, water, and resources everyone needs to live. Remember we are water protectors from the past spring? That was a native group. Look after our citizens' health, education, and safety. Share information with the United Nations about our treatment in the United States. And work together to shape federal and state policies that affect our citizens. All the while we say, we are still here. There's all their presentations. But all those different aspects, the ups and downs of the Native nations in the United States. And it makes me sad. 
My ancestors came from Slovakia, Sweden, Scotland, and England. If they hadn't come to America and met each other here, I wouldn't even exist. But some of my ancestors from England were among those very colonizers who took the land by force. They were actually among the famous pilgrims who settled in Massachusetts with the Wapanoag, which, as we said last year, was not always a happy relationship. On one hand, they shouldn't have taken the land from the people who are already here. They shouldn't have forced all those people to do things their way and follow their laws. But on the other hand, most of the people who live in America now had ancestors that came from somewhere else. And there are new people coming from all over all the time. So does that mean we all don't belong here? Or that we shouldn't have come? I don't like that though. Too many people say that about immigrants to new countries as it is. But there's a big difference between emigrating and colonizing. There is. Most people, when they move to a new place, do not act like colonists. They don't try to take over the new country. They bring their home cultures, but they learn from the people of the new land as well. As long as no one tries to be better or more powerful than anyone else, people of different cultures can share the land. If the colonizers hadn't decided that they deserved the land more than the indigenous people who had it first, they could have all lived in harmony. Here's a story about an Inuit village. We've read about the Inuit before. They're an indigenous people who live in northern Canada and Alaska. But this is a story about that village's first European visitor. He's a trader, but he goes about things in the right way not trying to force the Inix of Ukpik's village to live like him or accept him as their boss, but talking with Ukpik's father, the real boss of their village, as equals and offering to exchange different bits of culture, cheering. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean the two cultures merge seamlessly, but let's see what it's like. This is called Unahuna, or What Is This? by Susan Aglukark. Illustrated by Amanda Sandlin and Danny Christopher. Susan Aglukark, who, like the people in this story, is Inuit, although this story takes place a long time ago when European and Inuit cultures were first meeting, before their cultures had really blended. You see, even her name is blended. Her last name, Aglukark, is an Inuit name. And her first name, Susan, is an English name. And this story is all about names. One early summer morning, Ukpik woke before anyone else in the camp. She quietly snuck out of bed and went outside to play with her new puppy. Ukpik had yet to name her puppy, and she had snuck out early every morning over the past few days to ponder what she should call him. Ukpik picked up her puppy and held him in front of her face. What shall I call you, puppy? Ukpik said. Hmm, Kimik? She tried. Uh, that word meant dog. And no, that does not suit you. Maybe Kulak. Kulak meant sweet, dear, or cute. Ukpik looked over at her puppy's father, who was a big, strong husky, and laughed. No, Kulak is too cute. You won't always be this tiny. Suddenly, the other huskies started barking in the direction of the water. Ukpik looked out over the water and saw the mast of a ship approaching her camp. Atata! Atata! Ukpik called to her father. Hey. Remember in my Anana's Amaltic, Anana meant mother. Here, Anatata means father. They're similar, easy for babies to pronounce names. Atata and Anana. Atata quickly crawled out of the tent to see what Ipik was hollering about. A smile appeared on Atata's face as he saw the ship. He knew the captain had come back for another season of trading. Tupalikta! Time to wake up! Time to get out of bed! We have visitors! Atata called to the rest of the camp. Atata called out instructions, letting everyone know it was time to prepare for the captain's arrival. In a matter of minutes, the camp was abuzz with activity as everyone prepared to meet the visitors. Atata handed a skin bucket to Utpik and instructed her to go fill it with water from the stream. Utpik took the bucket in one hand and tucked her puppy under her other arm as she walked to the stream to fill the bucket. As she walked, she whispered to her puppy, What about Ismatak? That name meant boss, and it made her giggle to herself. 
When a quick return to camp, a fire had been lit, moss had been gathered to keep the fire going, water was being boiled, and food had been collected and gathered at the fire for breakfast. But Pink placed her bucket of water by the fire. She set her puppy down as she sat beside her Anana, her mother, to eat breakfast. Nana, I can't think of a name for my puppy, Lipdick said. <laughs> Just eat your breakfast, Lipdick, Anana said. We have visitors right now. We'll think of a name later. Lipdick quietly ate her breakfast, petting her puppy with her free hand. She could not stop herself from thinking about new names. Hmm, Lipdick thought. How about Pew Pew, or Pretty Pretty, or Pingrak, My Toy, or Kitik, Play? Pink could have thought up names for her puppy all day long. Early afternoon, the ship had finally landed on the mainland, and the camp was busy helping unload. Upit Satata and the captain were catching up on the past winter's catch, and what could be traded for the seal skins and fox furs Satata had prepared. Uh, last summer, I saw you eating with these funny-looking wooden things, Satata said. I tried to make some over the winter, but I cannot get big enough pieces of wood to make more. Do you have some to trade? You mean forks and knives and spoons? The captain asked, as he reached into his trunk and pulled out the wooden eating utensils. E yes, that is what I mean. I would like some of those for our camp. Maybe a trade? Tata asked. The camp had never had eating utensils like this before. The two men came up with trading terms, and Tata was quite happy with his new possessions. Lipnik stared at the utensils. She was so curious about them. While Tata was not looking, Lipnik took a set of utensils. She walked over to the stream with her puppy, where she could watch all the activity in the camp while playing with the new gadgets. The utensils were wooden, and although the shapes looked familiar, they were still odd by Pick's estimation. One was a long stick, thicker at one end, and very thin along half of its length. It reminded Pick of her father's panna, or his snow life, but it was much smaller. But Pick decided it must be used for cutting things. The second piece she could not quite figure out. She poked it into the earth, and it picked up a berry. Hmm, she said. Look at that. It picked up a parngog. The pick moved on to look at the third piece. She realized after a while that it was like a little bull. She dipped it in the stream, and sure enough, the little bull picked up some water. She put it to her mouth and took a sip. Lupik was quite excited about these new things. She grabbed her new toys and her puppy and ran over to show Atata and Anana. Anana, Atata, let me show you something! Lupik happily called to her parents. Lupik's parents and the captain all turned toward her. Lupik picked up the fork and poked it into a patch of berries, saying, This pokes things. Next, Lupik picked up the knife and looked at her Atata. This is like your panna, but smaller. Then Lupik picked up the spoon. This is like a small bull. But Pick beamed over her new discoveries. And Nana, Tata, and the captain could not help but laugh at her excitement. Good for you, Pick. You quickly figured out what those are for, Tata said through his laughter. I have an idea, he continued. Why don't you gather up all the children and show them how to use them? But Pick thought about this for a few seconds. E, a T, yes, let's go. I would love to do that. Lutpik set about gathering all the children and directing them toward the stream. Taking her new responsibility very seriously, she organized the children into a half moon. She placed the utensils in the middle of them all. Okay, everyone, watch and listen, Lutpik said. These are very important, she continued, gesturing toward the utensils. I'm going to show you how to use them, so you have to pay attention. Be sure to listen. This is very important. Lutpik decided to start with the knife. This is a little panna. You can cut things with this, so you have to be very careful with it. Lutpik's best friend, Kopak, took the knife, and the children took turns studying it. On the pikasuk? Does it slice things? Kopak said as she cut into a berry. Lutpik smiled at Kopak in agreement. Lutpik placed the knife back down and picked up the fork. Una sorta kakavak. This looks like a fishing spear, Lutpik said. She picked up the kakava, which they used for spearing fish, and she handed the fork to Kopak. The fork and the kakavak made their way around the group. Each of the kids saw the similarity for themselves. Opik then picked up a spoon. This is like an alut, a ladle, 
because it scoops water, Glimdick said, as she took the spoon over to the stream and scooped up some water to take a sip, just as she'd always done with the ladle used around camp to scoop soup or water. Teaching the other kids about the utensils was a lot of fun. After Ukpik's lesson was over, most of the children made their way back to camp. Ukpik, Kopek, and their friend Anguti stayed behind by the stream. I don't think I like these new things very much. Do you guys? Anguti asked the girls. I don't know, Anguti, Kopek responded thoughtfully. I mean, they don't really bother me, but I can still eat and drink without them. Ukpik, why do you think your Tata wanted these? Are we going to have to use them all the time now? Lupik thought about this for a few seconds and finally responded, I don't know. I'll have to ask Atata when I get a chance. The three headed on back to camp, lost in their thoughts. Once back at the camp, Ukpik handed her utensils to her Anansia, her grandmother, who was cleaning and organizing all the utensils in a bucket. Oh, there they are, Ukpik's grandmother said. I thought we had a set of twelve, one for each family, but I only counted eleven. Thank you, Ukpik. Rather than Ukpik's usual cheerful, you're welcome, Anatsiak noticed her silence. What's on your mind, Ukpik? Anatsiak asked. Anatsiak, why do we need these anyway? Are we always going to have to use them? We never needed them before, Ukpik said, looking down at the forks and knives and spoons. No, Lupik, and then Antiak began. The captain has been bringing us some very interesting things to learn to use. Some of them have been very helpful, and some just make things easier. Maybe this is one of those things that makes things easier. I grew up thinking that my world would always be like this. Nansiak motioned around her at the peace of the land, the tundra, the camp, and the people. When the captain first arrived, I saw for the first time that all of this is a gift, and slowly we are sharing it with the captain's people, and in turn, slowly his people are sharing their ways with us. And Natsiak reached down and placed a spoon in Upik's hand. Now, every time you spoon up some soup, you will think of the alu. Some things happen that can never be unlearned or forgotten. The captain arrives, and every time he returns, we're anxious for new things. But he brings us only what he can, so we only learn what he gives us. Our minds and hearts want to learn more, and we are impatient. But there's nothing we can do about this, so we get even more anxious. This is what you're feeling. You have so many questions, and we don't even have the words yet to ask with. That is our challenge of it, to understand what is in that other world a little bit at a time. Even if our world will not stay the same, our camp and our family will always be here to learn about these new things together. Upik leaned into her grandmother, spoon in hand, and looked out at the water's edge, where Atata and the captain were drinking tea and talking. Her puppy scampered up to her and jumped into her lap. As she looked down at the little fluffy face, Upik whispered, I think I'll call you Umat. That word meant heart or loved one. As Ook picks out watching the people in the camp that she loves so much, it seemed like a perfect fit. Aw, the doggy is her heart. That takes me back to the stories we told earlier this summer about how people all over the world love their Something pets. Something else the two cultures already had in common in this story. Everybody loves their pets. But you'll notice the captain didn't force the villagers to use his European silverware. It was something Ukpik's father wanted to try. They shared their good things across cultures. You know what my favorite thing is that people share across cultures? Food. I love trying new foods from all around the world. My favorite kinds of foods are Italian and Chinese. I don't have any ancestors from Italy or China, so if we hadn't shared our cultures, I never would have had a chance to try those foods. Let's spend our whole next visit talking about food. Uh, but not right now. We're talking about indigenous peoples today. I know, today. I shouldn't get too distracted. But I've got a story that combines both topics. A very special food that Native Americans created after the U.S. government had forced them away from their ancestral lands and onto reservations, when they couldn't grow the foods that they used to grow before and were forced to live on government rations, basic boring food. They took those basic boring ingredients and made something new and good, 
fry bread. Fry bread became a traditional way to celebrate life and family in indigenous communities all over the United States. It's a symbol of survival, of adapting and making something new even when the dominant European culture tried to starve them out. Also, it tastes good and is fun to make as a family. This is Fry Bread, a Native American family story written by Kevin Noble Maillard, who is Seminole. The Seminole people lived in Florida originally until the U.S. government forced them to move to Oklahoma like it did with the Cherokee. That's how traditions like fry bread blended across tribes. And Kevin Noble Maillard was born in Oklahoma, but now lives in New York City. And my grandfather, whose mother's family came from Sweden, grew up in the original Seminole territory in Florida. Cultures keep combining. They do. And the illustrator of this book now lives in Connecticut, but drew this book when she lived in Arizona, and she was born in Peru. We've seen her before, Juana Martinez Neal. She wrote and illustrated Alma and how she got her name, another story about family heritage. So, let's read about fry bread, a Native American family story. Fry bread is food, flour, salt, water, cornmeal, baking powder, perhaps milk, maybe sugar, all mixed together in a big bowl. Fry bread is shape. Hands mold the dough flat like a pancake, round like a ball, or puffy like Nana's softest pillow. Fry bread is sound. The skillet clangs on the stove. The fire blazes from below. Drop the dough in the skillet. The bubbles sizzle and pop. Fry bread is color, golden brown, tan or yellow, deep like coffee, sienna or earth, light like snow and cream, warm like rays of the sun. Fry bread is flavor. See beans or soups, milk tacos, cheese and vegetables, delight in honey and jam, rise to discover what brings us together. He's got a big pile of fry bread there. Fry bread is time. On weekdays and holidays, supper or dinner, powwows and festivals, moments together with family and friends. Fry bread is art, sculpture, landscape, portrait, or daily craft, shared from teacher to student, a cycle of heritage and fortune. Fry bread is history, the long walk stolen land, strangers in our own world, with unknown food. So we made new recipes from what we had. Fry bread is place. Alaska, Kansas, all the way to Maine, down to Delaware, on to Georgia, over to Oklahoma, Colorado, California, cities and lands we call home. Fry bread is nation. Abenaki, Apache, Arapaho, Ojibwe, Onondaga, Ogallala Sioux, Narangasat, Navajo, Nipbuk, Seminole, Shoshone, Sac, and Fox, hundreds and hundreds of tribes. Fry bread is everything. Round, flat, large, small, north, south, east, west, brown, yellow, black, white, familiar and foreign, old and new. We come together. Fry bread is us. We are still here. Elder and young, friend and neighbor. We strengthen each other to learn, change, and survive. Fry bread is you. And on the last page, the author gives his recipe for fry bread. He says that there are many different recipes for fry bread. This is just one way of making it, and people all over make it differently. But he learned his fry bread from the lady in this picture, which is his Aunt Fanny. You can see that, that the illustrator put Aunt Fanny's picture in a lot of the places throughout the book. Great! Mm. Next time we'll be talking more about food and how it ties people and their stories and cultures together. See you then!